Church, thank you <clears throat> so much for being the church. And we're just so grateful to have Pastor Corey with us leading that charge. Absolutely tremendous. Well, this morning, I want to get real, real practical and really real with you. And I've entitled this message, Four Questions. Because if you're like I am, as we have, we're now in month five of whatever this is. I am still left with more questions than answers. And I want to at least identify what the questions are. To be sure that as we approach God and in our inquiry with him, that we're asking the right questions. But in order to do that, I took a brief look back at some of the messages that I sense that God was emphasizing over the past few years. And Pastor Brett has graciously allowed me this pulpit the first Sunday of every year to speak that which I sensed God was saying to us for that season. And I went back and I looked at what those messages were for the past few years. In 2017, the message was the wind in the whirlwind, finding God in turbulent times. In 2018, the message was entitled, From Groaning to Glory. <laughs> Romans 8 was the passage that I preach from. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The true aspect of a prophetic people calling back and preparing his people in concert with God's design. And yet groaning sounds something so inherently negative. And yet, if you're like I am, you're learning to groan in this moment. 2019, the message was entitled, New Wineskins. The gist of that message being that there was going to be foisted upon us a new flexibility that was going to be required for that which God was going to be pouring out. How many of you have been looking around at all the masks this morning, and thank you for that, who knew that flexibility would involve hanging elastic around your ears and covering your face? Who had a clue what that really meant? And in that was that a wineskin comes to its point of maximum flexibility closest to the death of the animal from which it was taken. That our morbidity is directly related to our flexibility. How many of you have had to die to something in the past few months? Die to some idea, idea or ideal of this is how life should be or certainly this is what God is going to do. I have. And then this year, in January, out of season. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That God was bringing the church into an out-of-season moment in order to bring us fully in season with his purposes. And the sub points there that we would have to begin to see differently by the Spirit. I got to tell you, I have to, I have to live in the Spirit to just survive these days. Because I look in the natural and I don't receive a lot of encouragement from what I'm looking at out there. Having to see differently just to stay encouraged. And then sowing in a time of famine. These were the messages from January. Wow. I don't think it's any secret that we have experienced a seismic event. And this is a, a word that is being bandied about in the, in the media and the culture today that of seismic changes, seismic shifts. But what's unique about this one is that it's global. It's not specific to one location or one people. 
It has affected the entire planet at the same time. And the thing about seismic activity is that many times it's undetected. How many of you remember the, the little rumble we had a few years ago here in the D.C. Nova area? I mean, I, I remember I was, I was actually in the parking lot. It was just like, I got to get off the sugar. <laughs> it's the strangest thing in the world. And it didn't feel like anything. And yet, chunks were falling off the National Cathedral and cracks were forming, you know, in monuments. On, I mean, and, and, and foundational damage. And it didn't seem like there was much. Sometimes seismic activity, it's, it's so subtle, it's barely detectable, except for those seismologists that watch for these types of movements. And yet these movements can still disrupt and displace and damage foundations in ways that we can't even see. And yet upon further inspection, we begin to realize we can't use this building like this anymore. We can't, we can't put this many people in here anymore because not only could it bring the building down, but it wouldn't be safe for those inhabitants that would come in here. And I want to submit to you that there has been seismic activity, and I've shared this with Pastor Brett and some of my closest friends. Things have shifted and changed, and we don't even know what they are yet. We can get together and pontificate about the obvious. But my, my question, I believe, that is what has changed that we're not even going to know it's changed until we get up to it? And what and the, the demand on us for flexibility, for walking in the Spirit, for seeing differently. Let me just tell you, structures have changed. Hebrews 12 speaks to this, that one can be shaken, will be shaken. And yet, we are receiving a kingdom, what does it say? Come on, that cannot be shaken. It cannot. It's not subject to be shaken. If there were a kingdom that was going to be shaken... It would have been Jesus' death on that cross, three days in that grave. But let me just tell you, it got shaken to pieces when he came back out of it. There's no more shaking that can happen after death is defied. But shaking is fearful nonetheless. I've never been in a real earthquake. Folks that have, though, it's something to talk about. It's fearful. And that's the designer sense and feeling of the day is fear. Luke 21 says people fainting with fear of what is coming on the world. Men's hearts, another translation says, men's hearts failing them. And yet Jesus said in John 14, what did he say? Let your hearts not be troubled. Why? For I have overcome the world. Trust in me and trust in God also. What he said. But yet fear tends to scatter. But what happens is that faith gathers. We had an event happen in this room a few weekends ago. Horrendous. We had a pastor attacked. And I might just give you a good report this morning. Is that he is in rehab. He is recovering. God has moved on his behalf. But this is something that happens to everybody else everywhere else. Not here. Talk about being shaken. Oh my goodness. Pastor Jim, I thought you were a prophet. Why didn't you see this? Where were the intercessors? What's wrong with the security in this church? We didn't see it. 
We live in a fallen world. Stuff happens. But we were shaken nonetheless. And I might add, I'm not sure I will ever be over it. See, well, that's not a lot of faith in that statement. I'm just talking to you real this morning. Pastor AJ and I have been on the phone with many of you. And one of the things that I saw happen, particularly after that event, is what the enemy intended was to scatter the sheep. It had the very opposite effect, is that the sheep did this. Rather than do this, they did this. They got closer together. They got on those Zoom calls and figured out how to stay in fellowship and realized everything Pastor AJ has been saying about fellowship and koinonia might be right. <laughs> Hurts me to say that, but anyway, I'll just go ahead. All right. So then, what are the questions? I want to present four to you this morning because I believe two of them are the right questions and two of them are the wrong questions. And I'll give you the wrong ones first. Number one, why? John, the ninth chapter. Jesus is walking. He sees a man blind from birth. His disciples say, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? that he was born blind. Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Watch this. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work, but while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Might seem like a harsh question. Whose fault is this? And understand in Hebrew thought, the understanding was that all congenital or birth defects were always as a result of someone's sin. Be it the individual or generational sin that was now having consequence in that individual. So this was not a harsh, unloving question. It was a theological question. Who sinned? We want to understand why this man is blind and why this man is not. We want to get it in our brain. Cause and effect. Job, righteous by God's own testimony. Horrendous suffering. I'll talk more about Job in a moment. But whether his wife or his friends, something's got to be wrong with you. Certainly what you think about yourself and your standing with and before God, something's flawed. There's got to be some hidden sin in there somewhere, Job. Come on, fess up. Or we're only left with one on the conclusion. Something must be wrong with your God. Curse him and die. Wow. And opinions about what was going on from his friends quickly morphed into accusation. And yet even at the end of Job's ordeal, we're not left with a neat bow on the end of it. Oh, I've heard people preach, I'll double for his trouble. Double for his trouble. God added back. He still buried his first family. He still suffered in a way that we will never understand. How dare we make something that trite? And we're not left with a neat conclusion at the end of Job. Oh, I've got opinions. I've read some theological concepts and ideas about it. But I have to tell you, I'm a bit disquieted by Job. I really am. Because we want answers. I deserve an answer. 
God, tell me what's going on. Many times, it's just a celebration and the titillation of our cognitive prowess that we want to know. And yet, the last I checked, it says, we can't know the mind of God. His ways are beyond our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. How dare we think we're going to have the same cognition as the sovereign of the universe. We want answers, and we wouldn't understand them if God gave them to us. It's like your three-year-old. Daddy, explain the internal combustion engines to me. <laughs> well, you see, there's pistons, and then there's fire, and there's gas, and there's an explosion, and it pushes down. They're not, they just want to go, what makes it go zoom, zoom? That's all they want to know. I had an encounter with God years ago. I was in a meeting. God sort of rendered me helpless, for lack of a better word. Some people call it slain in the spirit. Hope that doesn't mess with you. It's okay. But I remember being completely helpless to physically move, but being aware of what was going on around me. And I remember having this discussion with God. It was really more of an argument. Okay, God, let me up. I'm tired of the carpet. I want to participate in this meeting. Couldn't, get, couldn't move. Okay, God. Well, if you won't let me up, at least tell me what you're doing. And he said, you wouldn't understand. Mike said, whoa, this is me. What do you mean? He, and then, he said, then, then it really got pearls. He said, son, it's none of your business. What do you mean it's none of my business? It's my business. He said, son, I'm doing some things in you right now that you won't understand for years. And he was absolutely correct. And if he had given me chapter and verse in that moment, whew, it would have been 30,000 feet. I wouldn't have gotten it. And why most often causes us to ask the wrong questions that subsequently gives us the wrong answers. And be they eschatological in nature, that which God is doing, epidemiological, political, whatever they might be. Is this their fault? Doesn't work. As one theologian put it, it's moments of crisis like this that just puts a megaphone in front of what we already believe. In other words, if you're predisposed to think that God is an angry God and just waiting to get to us, then boy, this is your moment. Congratulations. Scream on. I saw a billboard years ago. It said, don't make me come down there, God. Now, I remember that used to be something that I would hear from my dad if I were in my, don't make me. I understood it from dad. I knew what it meant. But don't make me come down there, God. And I thought to myself, there is some jacked up theology right there. I mean, that, the, the depth of what that billboard was entailing, that God is somehow an angry, vengeful God, that when he shows up, it's not going to be a good thing. Can I help you? He's already showed up and it was a great thing. He's already come down there. Are there reasons for judgment? Absolutely. You want some numbers? Here's some numbers. Latest COVID deaths in the United States through Friday were around 160,000. The last reported numbers from 2017 abortions, 862,320 in 2017. Don't ever think that God isn't looking. Don't think that the principles of God not answering, blood crying out, is not still accurate today. 
And yet, we're not talking about abortion anymore. Why? Because it's not politically expedient. Whether those who are against it or those that somehow think that there's a right to it. And yet, Lamentations 3 says, because of God's great love. What does it say? We are not consumed. For his compassion never fails. Why? The wrong question. Second question. Wrong question. When? Pastor Jim, when is this going to be over? What are the prophets saying? Most of them have been wrong. (laughs) Including me. One of them was Passover. Passover came and went. It passed over. (laughs) COVID continued to rise. I told Pastor Brett, I think Pentecost, May 31st. Guess what? I was speaking on the prophetic yesterday with the singles. It's always in the realm of the timing and the wind that we get messed up. When? And if COVID-19 or an unprovoked, unprecedented attack on a pastor could mess you up, imagine the trauma and the horror the disciples have just experienced. Of following this man that now has revealed himself to be the Christ. That they have now thrown in and done everything to follow. They watch him die. And now, who is this? What is the? What do I do with this? What do I do with this resurrected, resurrected guy? But imagine. And so here, we've been through this. With this, this whole cycle of Jesus' passion, his death, his resurrection, he's, he's there before his ascension and he's teaching the disciples. I would love to know what he was speaking in those 40 days. What is there left to say? What do you say? And yet, here was their question in Acts 1. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? They were still wondering about issues of when. In light of everything that had just happened around them, this dead guy is now in front of them teaching them and they're wondering questions of timing. Now the real irony is what they had already missed is that the kingdom had already come. Because of the resurrection, that was the event that ushered in the kingdom. They were still missing it in that particular moment. Wow. And what did Jesus say? It's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Interesting. Jeremiah. The nation is taken into captivity based on their rebellion. And in Jeremiah 25, where the prophet comes and gives Jeremiah the whys, the wherefores of how this is going to go down, That Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon are going to now take God's people into captivity. Connected with that initial revelation was this. It was, don't listen to the prophets who say differently. Interesting. And yet we move over just a handful of years And we find a prophet over in Jeremiah 28, I believe it is, named Hananiah. And Hananiah comes with this wonderful prophecy. Oh, yes, bring it. Within two years, I'll bring back to this place. All the articles of the Lord's house, et cetera, et cetera, I will bring back to this place. The king of Judah, the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon. God had already declared 70 years. But Hananiah said, nah, that's not right. It's going to be just two. It's going to be good. Two months after that prophecy, Hananiah was dead. Now, you would think that would have been enough. But we move over and we find another dude named Shemaiah. And this is what the Lord says. He says that the very, very similar thing. He said that, All of this is a lie. 
And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, send this message to the exiles. And this is what the Lord says about Shemaiah. But what he's prophesied to you, even though I did not send him, has led you to believe a lie. Interesting. You see, God has a prescribed time because he has a prescribed purpose. We need to always remember that. And he does now. And one of the things that was very clear for me is that I heard God say this, son, this is not a season, this is a shift. Because we're waiting for the win. We're waiting for the vaccine. Come on. But even with a vaccine, we're going to have a large, majority, a large group of people that are going to choose not to get vaccinated. They're not going to do it. And so the vaccine alone is not going to make COVID magically disappear. Once the government gets, I mean, it, it, it's not going to happen. Now, I'm not trying to depress you this morning. I'm giving you some realities. Plus the imprint that COVID has made on us psychologically. It doesn't just go away with a vaccine. And he said, son, this is a shift now, not just a season. So this moves us to the last two questions, and I'll move through these quickly. The first is what? Once again, Job. I mean, what are we left with? Awful circumstances, apparent gross injustices, whatever comes against us. We need to understand like Job to declare that God is still good. And the very first thing that we need to learn to do in the what is lament. And we'll give you four points under this point. Pastor Brett's already preached a marvelous sermon about this. So I'll only make mention of it. Lament. Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus wept. And you know, I used to preach, what was the motivation for God himself to weep? Jesus knew in advance what he was going to do regarding Lazarus. And I used to preach that he was, he was broken at their unbelief. But you know what? I've backed off from that. I don't believe that anymore. I really believe that Jesus was caught up in the moment, death, a brother, a friend, the friends. He's, he's caught up in their moment of grief. And he allows not only his humanity, but the pathos and his divinity to join in that moment. And he wept with them, even knowing that moments later, he was going to call to the dead guy and he was coming out of that grave. He knew what was coming and he still wept. Wow. Jesus did it. See, lament is not a failure of faith or an accusation against, against God. It's the acknowledging the obvious and inviting the Holy Spirit to be the comforter. And we've got lots of scriptural examples around us. An entire book of the Bible, Lamentations. A good chunk of the Psalms or a blueprint of what it means to lament. Wow. And yet in the contemporary church, oftentimes, we're taught well how to rejoice and prosper, but left lacking in instruction of how to weep and suffer. But many of us have had a crash course of late. And one reason we try and contextualize suffering, we, we create an escape mechanism. Well, that's this world, and I'm going to fly away. Ah, ah, so we adjust our eschatology to get out of this mess. Or we just try to keep it out of sight as much as we can, and we just try to sing our songs a little bit louder. But see, COVID's not allowed that. Dear friend and pastor in the emergency room and in the ICU hasn't allowed that. It's been in our face. And many, if not most households on this planet, and this isn't a curse, 
will be affected, whether directly or indirectly, relationally, economically, there will be effect. My wife and I and none of our children, our immediate family, have gotten COVID. But I know a lot of people who have. A lot of people. David Webb, our missionary to Africa, we'll, we'll talk about in just a moment. His kids have COVID. So it's not a matter of who gets and who doesn't. This virus doesn't, it's just not a respecter of persons. Everybody, everybody get this? N.T. Wright says it this way. Our culture is afraid of grief. But not just because it is afraid of death. That's a natural and normal, proper reaction to the last enemy. Our culture is afraid because it seems to be afraid of the fear itself. Frightened that even to name grief will be to collapse forever. Well, we have to keep going, we tell ourselves. We have to be strong. Well, yes, strong like Jesus who wept at the tomb of his friend. Strong like the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to our mortal bodies too. But who right now is pleading for us with groanings too deep for words. Wow. Second point is leaving. Can only mention this. Can't look over your shoulder for the onion soup anymore. It's not there. I miss restaurants. I miss the smoked salmon and the Aussie rolls at Sweetwater. I got to tell you, I miss it. You got to leave. You got to learn to live in this moment. Jeremiah 29, which we quote the parts that we like. I know the future I have for you, the plans I have for you, says the Lord. But he gives us some specific instructions there as to what Israel is to do in the midst of this captivity, in the midst of this moment. Build, settle down, plant and eat. Sounds a lot like sowing, doesn't it? Family. Get married, have kids, put a priority back on family, increase, do not decrease. In other words, don't stop what you're doing and then pray and pray, pray for the city to which I have called you. Why? Because if it prospers, come on, you prosper. Let me tell you, there's a lot about our nation right now I'm not real pleased about. And it's hard for me to represent either as an American or as a Christian. It's hard. But that doesn't negate my response and responsibility to pray for this nation. You know why? Because we're commanded to in Scripture. And because Jeremiah said it, if it prospers, you prosper. Wow. Wow. We've got to figure out how to do this. You see, the kingdom is not an out there thing. It's a right now thing. Now, now, I am the life. It's not tomorrow, it's today. The Sermon on the, brow, the, on the Mount, the blueprint of the kingdom, not just out there, now. A blueprint for what God has deemed and established the Gospels are not just out there. They're right now. They're contemporary. They're current. Jesus opening, teaching there in the synagogue. That famous passage, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's appointed me to preach good news. And he closes the book and he says, today, today, the Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And as we go from season to shift, living means now. Not looking backwards when we could go into a restaurant or to a movie theater or do what we wanted to do without being all masked up. That's leave it. Figure out how to live today. How to figure out what now looks like for you. And each one of us have to figure that out. Many of us have wrung our hands and said, oh, we can't assemble the way we used to assemble. We've got limitations on what we can do. You know, I was pondering this. We've always had limitations on assembly. We only have so many seats in this room. 
We only have so many parking spaces. We can only accommodate so many children at one time. We've always had assembly limitations. Certainly not this severe, but we've learned to operate within those parameters. We will learn to operate within these. With the same grace, the same presence of God, and the same precious fellowship that we've known in the past. I am not in the persuasion that somehow we just say, well, that's that, here's this, we'll do the best we can. No, that's not kingdom. I know I'm going late, stay with me. The Bendixes and the Critchers have a tradition, we call it Monday Mexican. We go down to the big city of Front Royal and we order the number five on the lunch menu because it's cheap and we're old and we're cheap. And the food's not even good. It's just cheap. Just a notch above Taco Bell. But it's all the chips you can eat. And that makes it worth it. But we have this tradition and it's not about the bad Mexican food. It's about something that we do every Monday to be sure that we're continuing to stay in covenant and, and that we're, we're doing life together. And it got disrupted. Our Monday Mexican place closed. <laughs> Old El Paso doesn't get it done. So we figured out how to do it. They reopened, and we go down and we get takeout with our mask on. And we bring the takeout to our outdoor picnic table at his house or my house. And we social distance around the table, and we have our Monday Mexican. We had to figure it out, but we figured it out. You say, that's an awful trivial, trivial example. Yeah, but you've got some just the same way that you need to figure out. The fourth is we got to look for opportunity. I wish I had time to unpack this. I'm sorry I don't. But I mentioned this in January of opposition becoming opportunity. And this church has done the most marvelous example of exactly what I'm saying. Do you realize has it been, it's been times of crisis? Some of the great plagues of the past where the church has been at its absolute best because it's been the church that would show up and do and go to places that no one else would go. The Emperor Julian, who tried to deconvert the Roman Empire after Constantine converted it, quote-unquote, in the 4th century, he complained that the Christians were much better at looking after the sick and the poor than ordinary non-Christians. They were being for the world what Jesus had been for Israel and people noticed. Martin Luther, the great reformer, had lived through several plagues there in Wittenberg in the 20s, the 1520s and 30s. And some of you saw this, but from a letter in 1527... Luther wrote this, with God's permission, the enemy has sent poison and deadly dung among us. So I will pray for God that he may be gracious and preserve us. Then I will fumigate to purify the air, give and take medicine and avoid places and persons where I am not needed in order that I may not abuse myself and that through me, others may not be infected and inflamed with the result that I become the cause of their death through, their neg through my negligence. If God wishes to take me, he will, be, he will be able to find me. At least I've done what he gave me to do and am responsible for neither my own death nor for the death of others. But if my neighbor needs me, I shall avoid neither person nor place, but feel free to visit and help him. Martin Luther, 1527. They'll know us not just by our love for one another, but by our love for them. Amen? Amen? And then lastly, the who. 
Let me just say this. In every life event, personal, national, global, it's all of holy design to leave a hole that only Jesus can fill. And our attempt to fill it with anything other than him will invariably lead us to ask the wrong questions, come to the wrong conclusions, turn to a man-made philosophy or a manufactured deity in order to try to fill that hole. And it will never work. And we have to learn to quickly interpret these events, not as to why and as to when, but as to whom. Where is Jesus going to make himself known in this moment? In the midst of the horror of what happened with Pastor Sean Clemens, we found Jesus moving. Don't forget it. What have I said? Asking the right questions. What and who rather than the wrong questions, the why and the when. Because by so doing, we'll find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. How then do we live? What do we do? Lament your tears, the sadness that you feel many times when you get up in the morning. It's okay. Go with it. Lament. Learn how to do it. Leaving behind what was. Leaning into what is, learning how to live in this moment. And then looking for the opportunities that God is placing in front of us all. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. God, we, I, I, can, I can be the first to admit, I don't like this much. I don't like the inconvenience of it. I don't like the discomfort of it. I don't like the news. I don't like the pain of it. Yes, I'm complaining. But in the same breath, I'm declaring that you are a good God. And you know what you're doing in the affairs of man. And so God, teach us. You are committed to making us men and women who are going to walk by the Spirit, not by sight, not by the flesh. So God, we embrace this to the extent that any human can embrace, embrace something that is so uncomfortable. We embrace it. God, we get in yoke with you in this moment. Help us. Help us. If you're in this room this morning or if you're watching online, there's a God-sized hole in you. For some of us, we've allowed Jesus to divinely come and fill that hole. But if you feel that hole and there's nothing there but the hole, there's only one answer. It's Jesus himself. Well, maybe you made it bigger through sin. Maybe you made it bigger through running. But God can fill it regardless of how big it is. And if you've never had a moment that you've allowed Jesus into your life, it begins by praying a prayer. Say, Lord, forgive me. I've not lived right. You call that sin. So I say I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And God, I declare, and I ask you now to come into my heart. Live inside of me that I might live for you. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If that's you, I want you to respond right now. And God will come meet you in a powerful way. God bless you, church.